Hi everyone. We're going to get started. Thank you so much for coming to this talk. It's obviously getting late in the day. We really appreciate you being here. Uh, my name is Colin Humphreys. Uh, I work in a company called Sintasso. And my co speaker is a uh, winner, who's here, who also works at Sintasso. Today we're going to be talking to you about building your platform product on multi cluster Kubernetes. So I'm going to start with a little section about why you would want to build a platform product. And I'm going to hand over to the winner who's going to talk about how you can build a platform product and is brave enough to attempt a demo that is working just beneath 50% of the time at the moment on, on conference Wi-Fi. So we'll see how that goes. And then, um, going to come back to me, I'm going to talk a little bit about multi cluster Kubernetes um, and about some of the other kind of uh, challenges uh, around building a platform product. So let's get started. So many, many years ago, when I started in my career in the late 90s, we had dev and ops, very much separate entities. So I started in operations. What used to happen was developers would write code, and they would throw it at me. I would say, this is rubbish, this doesn't work. They'd say, well, it works fine on my laptop. I'd say, I don't care about your laptop, I care about production. I'd say, what are you doing? I'm going to throw you out the window. They threw me out the window because there was more of them. It was all bad. So I decided I didn't like being thrown out the windows very much. I was fortunate that then, a few years after that, the DevOps movement kind of started. So that's about bringing development and operations together through a better culture, through automation, through measurement, um, and trying to work out how we can do better as an industry. So that had some amazing upsides, particularly culturally. And uh, I was on quite a few teams that were classed themselves as DevOps teams, they classed themselves as full stack teams. So what you often had was one team who'd be doing everything from plugging uh, CPUs into motherboards so and servers who get racked, doing the network wiring, doing everything, all the way up to writing the CSS, writing the JavaScript, writing the HTML. So we were all suddenly full stack engineers on DevOps teams. And that introduced a really high degree of cognitive load. You have so many things to think about. But a lot of those teams are very successful. So I've worked with organizations that have hundreds of DevOps teams. And a passage you start to observe is that each of those DevOps teams is building their own little platform, their own platform to serve their own workloads. So you end up with hundreds of platforms in large organizations. So you see a small example of that here with team A, B, and C. We see A, B, and C, full stack teams, but there's a high degree of commonality in those components that they use. So this kind of uh, inefficiency of large organizations with DevOps teams has led to the emergence of platforms. So you see, and it's quite fashionable right now, to talk about platform engineering teams, where their, their responsibility and their aim is to try and think about what are the common components and the common responsibilities of the application team and how can they support those application teams? How can they make lives easier for the application teams? And how can they reduce the cognitive load on the application teams? So that's why the platform engineering teams exist. So this isn't a new concept. You're all going to say, yeah, we were talking about platforms 10, 15 years ago. Absolutely right. So if we start thinking about platform engineering and what's happened and our experiences, we started to observe some trends and patterns in the way in which people do platform engineering. So I'd like to talk to you very briefly about four kind of sets of, of patterns that have emerged when people start to build platforms. So the first of those is the ticket pattern, typically using Jira, where we say, we're going to build a platform we're going to use uh, tickets. So if you want something from the platform team, you file a ticket. That has upsides because if you file a ticket and you say, uh, I want the database server, I want this much storage, I want this much RAM, I want this kind of logging, I want all of these things, I can then go and build exactly the database server you've asked for. The problems are that it takes time because you file a ticket and I might come back to you weeks, months later, it's quite common. Also, I might come back to you with something that's not quite what you asked for. So it's quite prone to error when I go and do this manual toil on the basis of a ticket. So 
So as a response to many ticket-based platforms, a lot of organisations just started handing out cloud accounts to the big public clouds. Now this was great because all of a sudden things were fast. You had self-service. If you go, you're going to fire up some of these instances, and then take some of these services, and then do all these things. It's going to be absolutely awesome. Quite often with these projects that I worked on where this happened, People, someone would go and put their credit card into public cloud, you go and build everything super fast, and in the last second, somebody from security or compliance or governance would show up and say, everybody stop. You're not allowed to do this. We don't know where the user data is. We've got all these um, PCI DSS, we've got SOC2, we've got all of these things we need to abide by. You haven't done any of them. Everybody stop. Everything's going to have to be completely re architected. So, a lot of challenges around doing that. So, effectively, the things that you get from a public cloud are great because they're on demand and self-service. What they are not is customized to your organization. They're not bespoke. They aren't exactly the things that your organization needs. So they lack that element from the ticket system when you got back something that was right for your organization from your platform team. Next model, we call this the raw Kates model, in which your platform team says, okay, we're just going to give you Kates. Kates is enough. We need to be probably some GitOps around Kates, so you put documents in the Git, and then they will be applied. But we as platform, we stop at Kates. That's good. Kates is fantastic. As we know, it has a clean and consistent ABI in Kubernetes. So, really, really powerful ABI server. The problem is, if you just hand out Kubernetes in its raw form, it's not a platform, it's really infrastructure concerns. So, you're leaving the burden of building that platform still on the application teams. You're not really making their lives much easier if things you hand out is just raw case. So again, that's a big challenge because you aren't focusing on delivering the platform for the application teams. You're really just saying, go and do it yourselves. And then lastly, <clears throat> the pattern where we see uh, platform teams effectively writing a lot of Terraform or a lot of Helm charts or other code, and then saying, take what you like to from this huge bunch of libraries, and then deploy what you like. So this is again a problem in that it's ambiguous as to who is going to actually look after that code when it's running. Are the platform team looking after it when the application team take those things and run them? Who, who's doing what around that ownership? You've got this inverse now of what used to happen when the devs, the application teams would write the code and throw it over the operations. Now operations people are writing a bunch of Terraform, writing a bunch of Helm charts, and they're saying, application teams, take what you want, and then you look after it on top of Kubernetes. So a whole ton of challenges there. What's nice about that setup, we've seen, is that often those Helm charts and that Terraform setup is customized for the organization. But the problem that it's got is it's not being delivered as a service. It's being delivered as code with ambiguous ownership. We're forking it, we're changing it people having to run it themselves. So as we've seen here with these four, there are pros and cons to all of them. And what we thought about in Sintasso, what would it look like if we tried to help people realise the benefits from all of the pros and do what we could to alleviate and remove the cons? So what we were trying to create was a system that would enable platform teams to deliver something that looked like this, where you as a platform team member are able to create a customised, bespoke for your organisation, on-demand platform API. So the application teams in your organisation can come to your platform and get hold of the right resources that are relevant to your organisation, that are compliant, that are governed, but they are available on-demand instantly when they need them. So that was the dream. And I'm going to hand over to my colleague Winner, who's going to show you how you can make that happen. Yeah. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Um, so as Colin said, we think of the uh, on-demand customized API as really the ability to bring together all of those advantages that we saw across the other four scenarios. And we built Cradix as a framework to help platform engineers and platform teams get that API off the ground faster. 
So I'm going to walk through an example organization that has an application team and a platform organization and talk about how you would build up uh, your um, options for your API and then we're going to try a demo. Um, so in this organization we have an application team and that application team has an application that needs um, serving, it needs data, and it needs cache. Uh, specifically, they said, really, we're looking to deploy via Knative. Uh, we want Postgres for our database, and we really want um, Redis to manage our cache, which is great. The platform team then takes in those uh, concerns, those requirements, requests, and using Cradix to build the platform, they encapsulate those services in what we call promises. So Cradix helps you build a platform that promises services to your application team. So in this scenario, you have, an, uh, you have an API now that with single requests, an application team can say, please can you give me a Knative? Please can you give me a Postgres? Please can you give me a Redis? And they get back all of those instances, and then it's just up to them to wire it together, and off they go. Which is great, but there is a step forward that you can go. Those lower level promises can be composed into a higher level compound promise, something like an environment promise, where rather than that application team saying, give me each of those individual things and I'll figure out how they wired together, instead, actually give me the whole lot, uh, let me just tell you what my application, team, my application is and let me run with it, which is great, um, but we know that most modern application teams aren't going to have a single environment. So what they could do with a platform like this is make multiple requests to that API to say, I would like a dev environment, I would like a prod environment. And then they're, they're then saying, okay, well now I have these two environments up and running quickly, now I'm just going to figure out how I want to um, deploy continuously and observe. Or your platform can cater to that as well. So you can build out, again, a compound promise where you're um, promising observability through Grafana and Prometheus. You have CI, CD, maybe it's Argo, maybe it's something else. And now all your application team needs to do is make a request for each of these things, pull it together, and then they are ready to go. But of course you can go one step further and actually pull all those together as one higher level promise. So you've already written those lower level pieces and you can quickly pull each of those into a higher level promise. You may have heard, um, I've heard over the last day or so, talks about golden path, paved path. This is an example of where a platform team would be working with an application team to say, what is that golden path for the type of application you're deploying? Well, here you go, single request, you'll get back all of the stuff that you need to get you off the ground and to keep you going as you continue to build features and build out that product. But as a platform team, most of the time, a little bit more than application teams, you have concerns outside of just those application teams. You have other parts of the business that have um, very real concerns that, as Colin said, can stop you in your tracks. Things like security, compliance, and governance. Those things are, are hard to inject into a platform, um, and we've seen that struggle a lot. And what Cradix does as a way to help with that is allow sort of bespoke business rules to be built into that promise through what we call pipelines. So as you can see here, you've got security, compliance, and governance. Um, where, as an organization, they've taken the decision that um, credentials are going to be stored in Vault and that deployments are going to be broadcast in the organization via Slack. So all at once, you've got some of the sort of bespoke needs that you have at uh, the organization level, the bespoke needs that your application teams might have, um, and then everything they, they need to get up and running, off and going. So we are now going to try to actually show you part of this. We don't, um, we're going to start from zero with a, a platform. So we're only going to actually install a promise that's a subset of that. We're going to have a promise that alerts via Slack when 
uh, deployments requested and starts, and then we're going to also create instances of Knative, Postgres, and Redis. Try, Let's see how pretty for it. So we're gonna do the demo. I'm gonna exit out of full screen mode. I'm gonna go into the terminal. I'm gonna run a couple things. And uh, what we've already done is for the demo, we're using Kind to set up some local Kubernetes clusters. Out of the box, uh, Craddix works with multi-cluster, which we'll talk more about in a few minutes. Um, so you'll see here that we have two clusters. We have the platform cluster and the worker cluster. Um, we've also already installed Craddix on the platform cluster, um, which we can verify by asking for promises. Uh, if you remember from the slide, I'll just slide back, um, app as a service promise. So this is a, a Craddix concept that through installing Craddix on the platform, we've taught Kubernetes. There are no promises because we haven't installed any yet, um, but at least we know that Kubernetes knows what they are. So the promise is, the promise definition is really just a valid Kubernetes document. It's YAML, um, what we all know and love. Um, and the, the way that you put the promise on to your platform is a sim simply just by applying or creating it. So we're gonna um, add it to our platform with one command and we can see if that's registered by again requesting promises and seeing that now we have app as a service, which if you recall, is the name of the promise um, that we authored. Uh, the other thing that got installed as part of the promise, so the promise encapsulates a couple things, but at a really high level, talking about that on-demand customized API, one of the things you decide as a promise author is what do you want the API to be? How do you want your application team to request this promise. Uh, so in this case, when we installed the promise, we also got a CRD. That CRD is the app CRD, uh, which is the way that our application teams will be able to request an instance of that promise. So now we're gonna switch hats, uh, and as an application team, we're going to make a request to actually get the services. The request, as you can see, is very small, and that's by design. It can be as big or as uh, small as you want, but in this case, we want to keep the cognitive load very small for application teams. We want them to tell us only what we need to know and let them let us configure and deal with the rest. So in this case, we do need to know what is the application name that you, you want to deploy. Um, we are going to take care of it for them um, in the promise we define. So where is it? So we can, we can run it. And then uh, sort of a lower level concern that we did expose is, well, what kind of database do you want? Because there is a reality where we may say, are, would you prefer MySQL? Would you prefer Postgres? Something else. So in this case, this is all that the application team needs to define. Um, and then, again, it's just a single, um, a single request to the platform to ask for <coughs> those resources. So if we um, take a look at the uh, apps that are in LI, you can see that that resource request came in. So the application team successfully submitted the uh, resource request and um, it's there on the system. And now we, I'm gonna go to a slide and just show you a little bit about what happens at a really high level um, on the platform. So again, this is what we've deployed. We've deployed uh, something that notifies via Slack and something that um, will create instances of each of the services that our application team needs. That single request came into the platform and then it hit the app's CRD that we installed when we installed the promise. And then internally, it created requests for each of those lower level concerns. So it generated a valid document for Knative, Postgres, and Redis. It also did something for Slack. 
Um, but it output those documents into a GitOps repository, where then we have our, our second cluster, our worker cluster, uh, pulling that repository, watching for changes, picking things up so that it can create the workloads where that application team can then go and access it. So if we go back to our demo, we can see what we have. So we already verified on the line above that we have the app as a service demo. Let's see if we got that lower level Knative. We do. So if you remember up here, our, um, our request said, the thing I need, I want it called Config Management Camp. And when we ask the platform, well, what is the Knative called? It's called Config, Conf Config Management Camp. Um, we can do the same and see what's there for Redis and for Postgres. So we have all of the requests on the platform for those services that the application team needs. And finally, uh, strangely enough, we also have a request for a Slack. Um, what that probably means, hopefully, is that if we switch over to Slack, we'll see that at 1752, we had an automated alert in our demo channel saying that the environment uh, request to come in and that we were working on deploying it. Hold tight, it'll be there soon. So, for now, ah, so, perfect. Um, so actually, I was gonna show the pods on the, um, on the worker, uh, just to show you, if I maximize this. Um, one moment, please. Um, you can see a whole bunch of stuff here. Most of it you don't have to worry about. You can see that um, you'll see operators, webhooks. These things were all installed, actually, when the promise got installed. Don't need to worry too much about it. Um, but you automatically got a Postgres. You got uh, Knative elements installed as well. You have Redis. So all the elements are there, successfully deployed via Knative. And this is our application. So uh, this is our um, very fancy application that our team is delivering lots of business value with. It works. Uh, I'll do a hard refresh to show the persistence. Postgres is all wired up. And that application team, in one fell swoop, has that application up and running for it. So that's all we have in this demo. But I'm going to turn it back over to Colin to talk through some more elements uh, about credits that we think are very valuable. So I'm going to go back in the slideshow. Here you go. Awesome. Thank you so much. So you just had a brief demo of kind of what graduates can do. <clears throat> so we created a part of this. This was just running on this laptop. So we did have a two-cluster setup running, uh, as we demonstrated. We did the one dev environment, and we did some notifications around Slack. Now, if you're actually running this in something like production, as you know, you wouldn't be running this typically all on one cluster or two clusters like we were just there, you'd want to separate this out across clusters because you have uh, security requirements that has to go where, you would have, um, you would have glass radius limits in terms of multi-cluster, so if one cluster goes down, you might be upgrading one cluster, except for all of these kind of reasons why we tend to go multi-cluster. I haven't spoken to anyone for a number of years that's trying to run one big Kubernetes cluster. I spoke to somebody last week who was running over 100 clusters the week before, I spoke to somebody uh, from a very large bank who's running thousands of clusters. So multi-cluster is real in terms of you know, production Kubernetes deployments. So if we look at this topology, just for this very simple app-as-a-service setup that we just demonstrated, it would typically look more like this, where you would have the observability, the CICD, the uh, security, compliance pipelines, all that kind of stuff running on a platform cluster. And then you'd have the dev environment running on one of the dev clusters, of which there will be many. And then that prod environment maybe needs to go to a secure PCI cluster 
that's set up in a certain way so it can meet with that kind of security and that compliance. So the way that we enable this multi-cluster experience in Kratix is that you would label these clusters in Kubernetes that are represented as a Kratix object. You label each cluster saying this cluster is a BCI cluster, this cluster is a platform cluster. And then in your promises, when resources are created, you set cluster selectors on those resources. And then we just schedule the right workloads to go to the right cluster. As Winner mentioned, there's a GitOps topology powering all of this. So we push out those documents, they go to um, uh, uh, repositories that are either you know, speak something like Git, as in GitHub or Git or something like that, or uh, something that's S3 like. So here we're powering the demo using something called Minio. So that's uh, uh, resembling Amazon S3. So you set up your clusters, you label your clusters, and we push the right workloads to the right places based upon cluster selectors. And then you can easily power and automate a multi-cluster environment. So the demo we just done, you know, has some complexity to it. Multi-cluster, we had pipelines running with Slack notifications, we created Knative, Postgres, and Redis on the fly, and then we pushed out an application to them and wired it all up. So there's a lot going on there. You may be thinking, to create something with this degree of um, uh, complexity and something that's composed in this way would be difficult for your organization. Because a lot of what's going on here is we're, we're trying to raise the abstraction level in the platform to get a high level API for the application teams. But that means life is now more difficult for the platform team. So uh, in Sintasa, we thought you know, that's our reason for existing. How do we make life better for the people on platform teams? So everything you see here in the setup, all of these technologies that we've, we've just spoken about. So we've got like Knative there, Prometheus, Grafana, um, Argo CD, Vault, etc. They are all available in the Kratix marketplace. Go to kratix.io forward slash marketplace. There's about 20 promises there. Um, everything we're talking about here, by the way, just to be crystal clear, is uh, Apache 2 licensed open source. So please do contribute. Please do have a look at it. You can use it how you would like to. So all of these promises are available. Please do contribute more promises as you write them. Very simple pull request link for additional promises. Now, I know this is the YAML conference, and we're all about YAML, but and obviously we just did a demo there, and we created the uh, app as a service instance from the promise. We created that resource via the YAML document that Winner showed, and it's a super simple YAML API. But this is going to come as a surprise to some of you, and it was a huge surprise to me. Not everyone wants to write YAML all day. There are people out there that don't. So when you add a promise to Kratix, it can automatically populate Backstage, which is a CNCF project originally created by Spotify, to automatically give you, uh, give your users that want to use a graphical user interface, uh, something that they can you know, identify with and they can use, rather than having to write YAML all day. So you can still have that uh, Kubernetes API where your kubectl apply in YAML, you can power the entire thing from GitOps, so you have people pull requesting into a repo and have that apply in YAML to Kratix, but then you can also create promises that are uh, automatically applied, so as you're adding and fleshing out your API in Kratix, you're also fleshing out your uh, GUI in backstage. And lastly, I did want to mention this, if you've gone to all that work to create an amazing app as a service promise, and it's fantastic, and then someone comes along and says, do you know what, actually, I don't actually want to use those, quite those components, I want to use a slightly different set of components. Because you've composed it from lower level promises, you've taken promises from Knative Serving, Postgres, Redis, together, and you've built together that higher level promise, you can then create a different developer experience easily by recomposing it and adding a few more promises. So you may want to do build packs for your containers, Kafka for queuing, MySQL for your data. It's very easy to take everything you've built so far, recompose it, create another higher level promise, and then you can offer a range of developer experiences from your platform. One of the things we've learned from experiences around things like Heroku is that there is no one actual developer experience that works for everyone. You as a platform team member have to craft the right range of developer experiences in your organization.
and we built practice to try and make that as easy and as simple as possible. So if you'd like to learn, like to learn more about Kratics, docs, guides, available on kratics.io, um, the code, github.com slash tato slash kratics, please do add issues, please do pull requests and changes, um, any contributions are more than welcome. Please do just clone it and use it, that would be great. And that's it for our talk. The QR code there takes you to a page where you can see a bunch of things around booking some time with us. We'd love to talk to you about Kratics and how we can make it effective in your organisation. Just have a chat about it, give us some feedback. Um, there's links to the docs, there's guides, there's a whole ton of stuff that's there. That's it for our talk. Thank you all very much for uh, waiting a bit later and uh, hanging around and having some time with us. We thank you. Are there any questions? One back there. Uh, thanks for the great presentation. And the demo uh, provided some project called uh, Kubernetes Service Catalog. And as we know, it didn't end up really well. And do you think it's uh, Catex can, can be like some alternative or like is, is it uh, like fundamental difference that will make the Catex successful even though the, the service catalog is not successful product? Thank you. If I try and repeat your question if I can. Uh, Catex reminded you of the Kubernetes service catalog? Yes. I'm not quite sure about the Kubernetes uh, it's, service. It's, it's definitely duplicated right now. Uh, and I wonder why. There's a lot of tools similar to, to such uh, to this approach to create some CLDs, to create resources on Kubernetes. Uh, and what is the fundamental difference between your product than others? Thank you. So the question, if I can again try and reflect it, play it back, was uh, what's the fundamental difference between this product and other things that are out there? So we have obviously have had a good look around the industry. So uh, at various different things. I haven't seen the Kubernetes service catalog. I think I know what we're talking about, and you're right, that one's been um, deprecated. There are various others that are out there. What we haven't seen is anything that enables you in a multi-cluster topology to orchestrate workloads across many, many clusters and provide a very high level API with this ability to add, add things like promises. So there are a few things out there in this kind of space, but we've yet to see anything that has this, this full view of helping you build that high level platform API across a multi cluster Kubernetes topology. And I think that's the real boundaries that you're working within an industry. You know, Kubernetes is just ubiquitous, we have to face that. It's available in multiple public clouds, it's on-prem. Kubernetes is just everywhere, edge, etc. So that's like the foundation that we work on as an industry. And then at, at the top level, we're looking at you know, how do we make application teams as productive as possible based upon multiple Kubernetes clusters. And there's nothing that I can see out there that enables you to orchestrate many Kubernetes clusters whilst powering that very high level API and enabling that degree of customization so you can really make something that's bespoke to your organization. If you think this can be done better using alternative tools, I'd love to talk to you. So that QR code has a link to book some time. Please do look at meeting with us, we'd love to talk to you if you think you can do this a better way because we're always about adapting, listening and about learning. But based upon our research, we couldn't see a way of doing this easily and that is why we brought Kratics. Any more questions? Cool. Thank you all so much for your time.